Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Scott Sagan, who is the Caroline S.G. Monroe Professor of Political Science and co-director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. Scott, welcome to our program. Thank you, Harry. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Dearborn, Michigan, just outside of Detroit, uh, the son of a Ford Motor Company auto executive. And uh, my mother was a homemaker, but had uh, been born and raised in India, uh, the daughter of the Methodist Bishop of India. Wow, and looking back, how do you think your parents uh, shaped your thinking about the world? Uh, in two ways. Uh, first, my father had a PhD in economics, but had not used it in university life, instead had gone into business. But he certainly was encouraging of an intellectual life and was uh, quite encouraging once I decided that I wanted to go get a PhD. My mother's influence, I think, was in part influential in my wanting to do international work. Uh, she had been born and raised, born, born in uh, Lucknow, India, raised in uh, what is now Mumbai, and, uh, in Delhi, and northern India, came to the United States to go to college. Um, and so the notion of studying something international was certainly not foreign to me uh, at all, even though I was growing up in the Midwest. And was there a lot of d discussion of international affairs and international events at the dinner table? Uh, there was. Uh, my father used to uh, quiz us on what was in the newspapers quite regularly. And my mother had an unusual habit is that um, she was an English major, but also was a, a passionate uh, India file. And so growing up, uh, we had a piggy bank on the dining room table and if any of the children made a grammatical error, we had to put a nickel into the piggy bank and it went to the Ludhiana Medical School in Ludhiana, India. Um, I learned how to speak properly. I think my siblings just were, were quiet at the dinner table. They had more money. To <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And uh, where were you educated? Where, where did you do your undergraduate work? I went to Oberlin College, uh, a small liberal arts school in Ohio that has produced I think quite a, a significant number of international relations specialists, Bob Jervis and Ken Waltz uh, among them, uh, and then went uh, for my junior year to the University of Aberdeen, Northeast Scotland, finished back at Oberlin, and then went straight to Harvard in 1977. And what did you uh, focus on at Harvard? Who did you work under? And what I was worked your under Sam Huntington and Stanley Hoffman. I had a left-right punch. <laughs> uh, so I, I picked um, two very distinguished political scientists, uh, both whom were, uh, I'd say, in the more historically oriented camp rather than the quantitative uh, camp of social science at the time, uh, but who had many disagreements. And I found actually having two people who uh, would give me very different kinds of comments was extremely helpful. Uh, and, and your dissertation was on? My dissertation, um, many people think because of my work on nuclear weapons that I, I started there, but I didn't. Um, my PhD dissertation was about deterrence before World War II and was a, an extensive study of the interactions between Japan and the United States that led to Pearl Harbor. So it is uh, related in that it's about deterrence and uh, prevention of war, and I was very interested in how a much weaker country uh, decided to attack uh, a much larger country in a manner that um, surprised us, in part because it was such a foolhardy thing to do. And uh, so, so history must have been a big part of, of your preparation and your work in, on that uh, work. Absolutely, although yeah. I, I didn't um, major in history. I majored in political science mm -hmm. and, and economics. Um, but I got very interested in international security in particular um, during that year uh, at the University of Aberdeen. I had a wonderful, at the time, younger professor there by the name of Phil Williams, now teaches at uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, Phil's a Welshman, uh, was an assistant professor there at the time, and asked one of the few American undergraduates there, since I was there for my junior year, if I would help him research a paper that he had been asked to write about the Mansfield Amendment. Mansfield Amendment, you'll recall, was an effort by Mike Mansfield, then senator from Montana, to pull U.S. troops out of NATO, to put more pressure on the Germans and others to increase their troop levels. Um, and I'd been advised by my father and others, when someone asks you to be your research assistant, 
help you in a project, do the best job you can. That's really your chance to, to shine and impress someone. So I did this. I worked as hard as I could. Um, I produced uh, a draft paper for him saying this, this is what I think happened and why and what you should report on and what the paper should be like. And he uh, saw me in his office the next day and he said, I can't use this paper. I was shocked. I was so disappointed. I said, why? You know, what have I done? He said, well, I can't use it because it's publishable as it is, and I've sent oh. it off. Uh, I just can't add anything to it. Um, so I've just sent it off to the publisher, and they're going to publish it under your name. And that was really wonderful. It's yeah. a wonderful thing for a professor to do to an undergraduate. Uh, and it also convinced me that I could, I could do this. Uh, and that's what inspired me to want to go on and political science. Yeah, it, the, but besides this example of integrity of, of his scholarship, uh, on the one hand, go back to Huntington and Hoffman sure. in the sense, did, did, did that, uh, uh, working with both of them, demonstrate to you that you could have clashes of ideas but, but Absolutely. Still, be, still be respectful? Absolutely. Um, both those individuals uh, were people who did not mind being in a disagreement and that could could, and they could accept that um, reasonable people could disagree. And they would try to bring evidence and theory to bear. That is theory in terms of, is this logical what you're arguing? And evidence is, does whatever form of evidence, whether statistical or uh, historic, does it really bear out the generalization or the argument that you're making? And having two people who not only disagreed with each other, but often would disagree uh, in print and with others uh, helped contribute to uh, a, I would say, a, a, a healthy uh, acceptance uh, of, of, of debate and dialogue that helps produce better arguments and helps push a field along. And if we all agree with each other, we don't move the field very far. And to the degree that we have disagreements and one ends up being stronger than the other, I think it helps uh, progress the field. You are a, an international relations specialist, and, and help us understand what you see uh, as the skills uh, uh, that are really required to do this work well. Uh, uh, um, how do you prepare? History is obviously important. Uh, history is obviously extremely important to understand the um, evolution of the subject matter that you're studying, um, to go, be able to go back and see what's new and, and what's old about what you're studying. Um, I think having a, um, a strong statistical or economics background helps to be able to actually see that you, you can measure some of these things and you should be skeptical about some of the measures that exist in the field and say that that's not all you need to do, but you do want to try to measure it and then compare them over time in order to have generalizations. I think uh, the hardest thing to, to teach um, is twofold. One is a creativity. You want to be creative and make links. And I, I don't know how to teach that just to, to encourage it and, 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 to, and to promise it. Um, and lastly, you, you, you have to uh, work hard. <laughs> Um, there's a famous Thomas Edison comment about invention being 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I put the ratio quite at, at, at that, but I think the inspiration, the creativity, and the perspiration, the hard work, uh, have to go hand in hand. I've seen plenty of people who have one and not the mm -hmm. other. I know a lot of people who work really hard but aren't creative, and a number of people are very creative but somehow can't have the discipline to, to produce. In, in terms of your own work, you would classify yourself as a realist, but you m have made the link with organizational theory uh, to bring new insights to realism. Is that a fair characterization? And then how did you come upon making those kinds of links? Um, I'd say it's a half fair characterization. Uh, I'm a reluctant realist. Um, it's not a, a, a philosophical approach or a, an attitude that I uh, fully embrace. Um, but I do recognize that power matters and that great states have strong incentives to act in a uh, power politics, realpolitik way. That said, I don't think that captures all 
of what's important in international politics at all, and that institutions do matter. Some realists claim that they don't. I think institutions are a tool that governments used. Um, and so in that sense, I, I appreciate some of the neoliberal institutionalism. Um, and lastly, I think that uh, the organizations that manage security are extremely powerful actors in, in their own right. And that we tend to, in realist thought, think about states as the sole actor, when in reality, um, the state's behavior is formed by groups of, of organizations. And those organizations uh, sometimes make decisions based on uh, national interests and sometimes make decisions based on very biased views or their own parochial self-interest. The, the critique of realism uh, came uh, over time, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, first from kind of people who looked at bureaucratic politics, uh, uh, along with uh, people who were studying uh, international, uh, the international economy and the changes there. And in terms of your work, you're coming at it focusing on the problem of nuclear weapons and deterrence. Right. Yeah, I think my um, strong uh, proclivity to uh, use organization theory um, stems in part from the experience I had right after graduate school. I spent one year as a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard uh, and wrote a, an article that was in international security um, about nuclear alerts. What happens when you take uh, the arsenal that you've built, whether it's on planes or, or uh, submarines or missiles, and place it on a higher state of alert to signal another side that you're serious or that you might use these weapons or to prepare for deterrence because you're concerned about an attack, or for whatever reason, and saw many things historically go wrong, that signals were misinterpreted, um, Actions were taken that the civilian authorities did not anticipate uh, and certainly did not appreciate. And based on that historical work, um, I was given a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellowship. These fellowships are given to, I think, about a dozen people a year, um, half of whom are government employees, and they go out into the academy or think tank. The other half are scholars under the age of 30 or 35 who go into the government. And their experiences and, and locations range from the uh, State Department to the Treasury Department to the World Bank uh, or to Congress. Um, I was the first one to get one in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So because of this work on nuclear alerts, I was given a position in the Pentagon, given uh, clearances of all different sorts that summer, had um, gone from a ivory tower of Harvard to a windowless room in the basement of the Pentagon <laughs> and told the director who had hired me that I didn't want to be a special assistant doing some kind of abstract study for him. That's too close to what I did as an academic. I wanted to be there in the bowels of the Pentagon working operational issues. So he put me in the nuclear planning staff. So uh, I was exposed to the war plans, how officers thought about nuclear weapons in an operational way. I was taken out on KC-135s out to the missile fields and to the bomber bases and shown what they were doing and saw them exercise, saw military exercise at the highest levels. And it scared the bejesus out of me. Um, you know, I understood the purposes of deterrence and I actually think that nuclear weapons have had some deterrent effects at some times in history. They are frightening. And the consequences um, would be horrendous if they were used uh, against a, a, an adversary. And yet at the same time, seeing how often the decisions from above get translated through this organizational filter and come out very different at the other end. Um, that experience inside the military um, shaped a lot of my subsequent scholarship. So I spent two years there and then uh, went back into the academy and started writing books, uh, all of which were influenced in one way or another by this organizational sense of um, strengths and weaknesses of organizations. What, what was the interplay between what you could find in the organizational 
theory literature mm -hmm. on the one hand, and then the observations that that uh, you were making. What, what was there a kind of a natural fit, or did what you were seeing on the ground kind of help you push the theory further along? A bit of both. Um, I set up the book The Limits of Safety as a test between two. Um, different theories about um, the ability of organizations to maintain high reliability. Uh, one camp, largely but not entirely uh, here at the University of California, Berkeley, were called the high reliability theorists. And they looked at, um, at a number of organizations, including aircraft carriers, um, nuclear power plants, and argued that you can have extremely high reliability um, if you have really competent individuals running them, if you maintain high tempos, um, and argued if you have lots of redundancy in the system, that if one system fails, backups can, can exist and save the day. The alternative theory was that um, most prominently uh, pronounced by the work of, of Charles Perrault, the Yale sociologist, in a book called Normal Accidents Theory, who took a very different perspective, arguing that um, organizations are complex and complexity means that no one could fully understand all of the details about what's going on. Um, they're highly interactive. One part interacts with another part, and the complexities and the lack of transparency that's produced, uh, coupled with the tight coupling that one thing can go wrong, another thing can go wrong quickly, produces a, what he calls a normal accident, not an accident that's caused by malfeasance, not one that is um, likely necessarily, but one that is normal and that it's going to happen sometime given the complexity and lack of transparency in the system. Uh, some of the additions I made to that theory were recognizing the roles of redundancy. The high reliability theorists thought, oh, redundancy saves the day. This is what you want. If one system, they do understand that no organization's perfect and that you have individuals who will make mistakes or routines that won't succeed. So you have backup systems. And a normal accidents approach would say, well, maybe the backup systems can cause the problem. It's what I've called in another work the problem of redundancy problem. You add more redundancy to a system and it makes it more complex. In nuclear power plants, you add more guards to make them more secure. Well, you also increase the likelihood that you've added a terrorist sympathizer in the guard force. If you add more redundancy, sometimes you can add a common mode error that will produce exactly the mistake that you're trying to avoid. So I approached this with pretty open eyes looking at nuclear weapons issues, being skeptical of views that said statesmen control nuclear weapons and, and they're a deterrent, having seen problems inside the military. But it was not until I started reading the organization theory literature that I began to see glimmers of, of what I had seen and explanations for what I had seen. And then I started developing it and went into, back into the history of nuclear weapons in order to see whether which of those theories was more accurate. And unfortunately, came to the conclusions that normal accidents theory uh, reigned. Uh, looking back at that work, is there one incident that, that really uh, grabbed you in a way uh, not all of them did. I mean, in, in revealing the, the, the role of kind of human error and organizational pathology yeah. with, with implications. And we have to remind our audience that when you look at that period, you're, you're really talking about U.S.-Soviet relations, which in many ways was a stable relationship. Well, it's seen as a stable yeah, relationship. Yeah. And I do think that nuclear weapons reduced the likelihood that both states went to war. But I think it also did so at the risk of some serious uh, possibilities of an accidental nuclear war. So let me tell you two stories um, from the book. Um, in late October 1962, as part of the alert for the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, Air Defense Command forces around the United States were told to go on alert and to put nuclear weapons on the aircraft that they had, uh, the mission of which was to launch into the air, and if you saw a Soviet bomber coming over, over the North Pole, you were to launch a 
air-to-air -air nuclear weapon that was going to explode somewhere near the Soviet bomber and destroy it. You don't want to have nuclear weapons exploding up in the air, but at least that was better than the Soviets dropping even bigger bombs uh, on cities. They were also told to be worried about Soviet saboteurs, what were called Spetsnaz forces, uh, and so had to have guards going around the perimeter of Air Force bases. At Volkfield, I'm sorry, at uh, the Duluth, Minnesota defense, uh, in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the guards uh, were marching around the perimeter, making sure that nothing went wrong. The aircraft were on alert with nuclear weapons on board, and someone saw a figure climbing the fence. In the middle of the night, shot at the figure, went back and rang the alarm that a sabotage attempt was happening. Around the whole Minnesota, Wisconsin, northern Michigan region, those alarms started going off because they were all interconnected, a complex system. At Volkfield, Wisconsin, however, the wrong bell went off. It had been hooked up improperly. Instead of the klaxon, instead of the bell announcing a sabotage alarm, the klaxon announcing that a nuclear war had begun and the Soviets had attacked us went off. So those pilots got on the aircraft and started their engines, started getting ready to launch their bomber force. Fortunately, the commander there called back to the Air Defense Command and said, we we're getting ready to launch uh, any more information. Do you have any? He was told, don't launch, it's just a sabotage alarm. It's not, you know, the war hasn't started. So he called it off and dead, indeed he actually got into his car and had to go on the runway because these were rather primitive bases. What started the whole thing? A bear climbing the fence. Not a Soviet bear, <laughs> but a bear climbing the fence. Now that's an example of the kinds of things that if you look at, at, at the history of nuclear operations, you'll recognize that um, nuclear weapons aren't controlled by these abstract things we call states. They're not even controlled by leaders. They're controlled by organizations. I'll give you one other uh, um, example. And this is, is, is disturbing. Clausewitz, the great German uh, philosopher of war, once said that um, civilian authorities giving leaders, giving orders, are like somebody giving, speaking a foreign language. They sometimes say one thing when they're really meaning to say something else, and they don't really, really understand the implications of everything they say. Uh, we've gone on alert a number of times, and some of which we didn't even know about until my research, for example. We know now that Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon ordered the Strategic Air Command to go on a high state of alert um, to signal the Russians that we just might use nuclear weapons over Vietnam, what Nixon called the madman theory. Now, I don't for a minute think that Nixon was really thinking about using nuclear weapons. Indeed, he called it the madman theory. And he knew that he was doing this to try to give Henry Kissinger a tool that Kissinger could say to the Russians, you've got to rein in the Vietnamese, bring him to the uh, negotiations, uh, because I've got this president who's crazy who just might use nuclear weapons. But he did put them on alert and did try to signal the Russians, did send bombers into the air to fly near the Soviet Union. The Air Force had no idea of why this was happening. The Secretary of Defense had opposed doing it, thought this was dangerous. And yet the Air Force, following orders as they would, started doing this. Well, what happens when you go on alert? In 1969, when this happened, we were in the middle of the war. Most of the well-trained Strategic Air Command bomber crews were located at Guam, because that's where the serious action was. People loading uh, conventional weaponry on aircraft to bomb North Vietnam. So at a number of Air Force bases, uh, if you look into the history, they're told to go on alert, to do so in a visual way uh, so that Soviets could pick it up. Uh, and they do so, but they don't have people trained with nuclear weapons. They don't have people who are certified to handle nuclear weapons. So following what you would expect a good military officer to do, taking his own initiative, they order people who have never been trained to handle these things to pick them up and start loading them up. Now that's a really risky thing to do. And yet they did it because they were told to go on alert. So they followed orders. But when I interviewed the people who had made these decisions and told them that, did you know what was going on down 
in, in North Dakota because of your orders. They had no idea of that kind of thing. That gets washed in the, in the weeds uh, of, of the organization. There are lots of things that go wrong inside complex military organizations. And that leads me to think that depending on nuclear weapons for deterrence it is really very dangerous. Um, I liken it to walking across thin ice. The fact that you did it once or twice during the Cold War mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you should do it in perpetuity and think that you're being safe because of the past. Now, as you move to the problem of nuclear proliferation, uh, I guess the, these concerns and these examples from the Cold War uh, really must heighten your concern. <laughs> you, Absolutely. You, you've been involved in, in a series of, of uh, books, articles, and debates with Ken Waltz, who is uh, sort of uh, the father of today's uh, realists in a way, uh, arguing about whether in a, in a world in which proliferation exists, there can be the kind of uh, stability that Ken uh, found uh, in a bipolar world, but which which you were even questioning in the work that you just described. Correct. So, so what is what what is it that a realist sees in the stability that comes with proliferation, and how do we get a handle on on questioning uh, the theoretical assumptions there? Right. Um. Well, a, a, a neorealist like Ken Waltz, and there are others, uh, John Mersheimer, Barry Posen, um, uh, a number of other scholars who have argued that the spread of nuclear weapons is um, less to be feared than to be welcomed because nuclear weapons pose such horrendic, horrendous costs if you're able to create a reliable second strike force that if you're attacked, you can retaliate that no one will attack you in the first place. It's a rational argument. It seems to be at least part of the truth of the stability during the Cold War, or, but as I suggested, there are lots of close calls, calls. How do you look at this problem in the developing world as new countries get nuclear weapons in North Korea or Iran or Pakistan or India? And I'd make two points. One is that their organizations like ours are going to make mistakes. And if anything, our history shows a really competent um, civilian controlled military still making lots of mistakes. So then you should assume that countries that have less vigorous civilian control, have um, less professionalized militaries, will behave in more dangerous ways. So that's point one. Point two is not directly derivative of organization theory, but it's related in that some states acquiring nuclear weapons do not see them solely as a deterrent. They see them as a shield behind which they can take more aggressive action. And I believe that military organizations, if they think that war is inevitable in the long term, which by their training and by their um, self-selection to the profession, have a higher likelihood, not all of them do, but have a higher likelihood of believing that, tend to think they should gauge in preventive war while they're ahead. And if they think that nuclear weapons are a good deterrent against somebody else, it also gives them an incentive to use force at lower levels, what's called the stability and stability paradox. Now, during the Cold War, we didn't see a lot of that. But between India and Pakistan, we certainly do. And I think it's one of the um, most stunning examples of the problems of countries getting nuclear weapons. Pakistan gets nuclear weapons uh, in the 1990s and tests them so that they finally have what is seen as a visible deterrent in 1998. And do they suddenly become peaceful? Absolutely not. Their military plans a secret operation to send Pakistani troops disguised as Mujahideen into Indian-held Kashmir territory. And it creates the Kargil War. Cargo was the name of the town uh, near where, where these troops had been sent. Um, it's an unusual event. It's one of the rare times where two nuclear states have gone to war against one another. It is one of those rare occasions where, at the time, two democracies, coded in the way political scientists do, using 
uh, what's called the Polity IV data set, both India and Pakistan at the time were democracies. One of the very rare cases where two democracies went to war. And interestingly enough, it was partly because Pakistan had nuclear weapons. But I uh, actually also believe that the Pakistani civilians had relatively little to do with the decision. And therefore, mm -hmm. it has a lot to do with the um, pathologies of the Pakistani military and their ability, given the weakness of the Pakistani state, um, the Pakistani military's ability to make decisions on their own. So, so we have a, a case where uh, uh, we almost got a nuclear war and in which uh, the assumptions of the realists basically uh, don't play out or at least the situation seems to be so dangerous and we were so on the edge of a cliff that might have led to a nuclear conflict that, uh, uh, th that it makes one wonder. <laughs> it makes me wonder. <laughs> right. So, so uh, in that particular case, all of the expectations weren't met, basically, that, that the realist theory would point to. Well, Waltz argues that they were mostly met and that he will counter my argument by saying that, um, okay, they went to war, but it wasn't a serious war. You can still have minor skirmishes mm -hmm. under nuclear weapons, and the Indians didn't attack because the Pakistanis had nuclear weapons. And I would argue we don't know what the Indians would have done had the Pakistanis not mm -hmm. pulled back. Maybe you're right, but the fact that they actually had a thousand battle deaths shows that it was a war. And the fact that the civilians had to intervene to get the Pakistani military to withdraw and the Pakistani military still opposed it. Indeed, that was one of the causes of the coup eventually against the Nawaz Sharif government. So I'd be a little more skeptical about this example being used as a sign of stability of, of nuclear weapons. Now I'll make another point. You made the, um, an analogy by saying we were on the edge of a cliff. Um, the great economist and strategist Tom Schelling solved or at least gave one solution to the problem of credibility with nuclear threats by uh, talking about the threat that leaves something to chance. What at the time in the 50s and 60s was, was often called brinksmanship, mm -hmm. saying that when two sides have nuclear weapons, it's hard to have a credible threat to use nuclear weapons first because you know that the other side could retaliate and mutual disaster could occur. So what credibility do you have in terms of signaling that you might use nuclear weapons first? And Schelling had a brilliant insight. He said, well, you can't really threaten that you're going to jump off a cliff, but you can threaten to come up to the edge of the cliff and to come and take some risks and take steps that create a risk that you're falling out of control. The most charitable view of what Pakistan did in 1999 is that kind of vision, that it took great risks sending troops into um, Indian-held Kashmir. It was trying to force India to uh, make compromises over Kashmir and did so even under the umbrella of nuclear weapons because it was walking on the edge of a cliff, deliberately threatening that things could go wrong. Um, I think that's a fair way of interpreting what they were doing, except I would note one thing. People often use the analogy here of a game of chicken, of, of two cars going towards each other, threatening the, which one's going to swerve, or in the James Dean uh, Rebel Without a Cause, going up towards a cliff and seeing who's going to stop. And what I would note is Pakistan in 1999 may have been driving a car towards a cliff to threaten India, but the civilians were at the wheel, the military was pressing the accelerator, somebody else was pulling on the brakes. This was not a rationally controlled operation. This was a, a secretive operation that the civilians didn't quite understand what the military was doing. The military was behaving erratically. This is not the kind of nuclear signaling that um, you think is a, a very constructive thing. And, and you make the point, interestingly enough, that, that some of these actions gave off uh, signals or created vulnerabilities 
uh, that one could lose control of. So that th this this movement, uh, the, this vulnerability, invulnerability, I think is what it, you call it, where weapons are, the, the weapons are not uh, ready to go, so to speak, but in making and giving signals to make them ready to go, you make those we weapons more vulnerable, essentially, to terrorists who might want to move to, to seize those weapons. It's absolutely right with mobile missiles, which yeah. is what Pakistan uh, uses. So adding the element of terrorist risks yeah. on top of the traditional deterrent relationship adds one more complexity that should make, I think, even realists really worry. So in the Pakistani case, the Pakistani government, civilian and military, is aware that they've got a huge terrorist problem in their country. You know, the, the Pakistani uh, senior, their, their Joint Chiefs of Staff Command Center has been attacked by terrorists. Their uh, prime minister candidate and their president has been uh, either assassinated in the former case or attempted assassinated in the, in, in the latter case multiple times. They know they have a problem. So they keep their nuclear weapons um, in storage, on military bases, um, not in the high state of alert that they would have normally, that, w that say we currently maintain or that we certainly did during the Cold War maintain today. But they have a vulnerability and vulnerability problem. In keeping nuclear weapons on, in storage next to the missiles on a base, mm -hmm. they know that if there's ever an attack by India or the United States against those bases, those weapons are vulnerable. So if they're worried, either for signaling purposes or just for defensive purposes, they feel compelled to take their nuclear weapons out of the base, put them with the missiles on the, uh, on the TELs, the uh, launches, launchers, and move them onto the countryside. That makes them less vulnerable to an attack by an enemy state, but more vulnerable to terrorist seizure either by an outside group or an insider collaborating with an outside group. And how there's no solution to that vulnerability and vulnerability paradox. It's one that the Pakistanis try to maintain security at all times, but they know that once they put weapons out into the field, it's a much more dangerous game. In, in the case of some of the actors that we look at now and sort of get chills up our spine, Pakistan, then Iran, we, we have the uh, additional element, looking at your, your theories of the, the role of organizational behavior of, of religion in the mix, and the, the fact that the, the weapons are controlled in these particular countries by organizations that may, with another uh, arm, be sponsoring terrorism. Right. Uh, talk a little about that, because that would seem to add to this equation in a, in a really frightening way. We have to worry about what the religious beliefs right. tell you about using uh, nuclear uh, uh, weapons on the one hand, but also uh, the the sort of mixed goals here. Right. Well, will, in the case of Iran, will support Hezbollah and Hamas? Does that mean that uh, the same organization that's controlling the nuclear weapons uh, makes a more dangerous situation? Right. Um, I don't think that uh, only religious terrorists, and I don't think only uh, uh, Islamic terrorists have been interested in getting nuclear weapons. Historically, um, the Aum Shinrikyo, the Japanese cult, mm -hmm. was interested in acquiring nuclear weapons because they thought that starting a major war would be a, a positive thing and that they would survive and inherit a more peaceful world. And their leader would, was the Messiah. That's and right. Yeah. yeah, he was yeah. somewhere in between Jesus Christ and the Buddha and uh, would lead this, this cult. Um, Left-wing terrorists in Germany and Italy in the 70s sought nuclear weapons, and Osama bin Laden clearly has. Now the good news is that none of those groups have the capability to manufacture capabilities themselves. The bad news is that they've all been interested in either stealing or using an insider who's sympathetic or bought off somehow. And we know of cases where 
the Al Qaeda organization has had sympathizers inside Pakistan, uh, inside not just the country of Pakistan, but inside the Pakistani military and the Pakistani nuclear establishment. Um, the Pakistani government has an interest in trying to reduce that. But when I first started going to Pakistan um, after the 1998 tests, I was quite shocked to see the organizational structures that they had set up. They had a concern about terrorists, so they did have a group that was responsible to vet the officers who were in charge of maintaining, securing, and potentially launching nuclear weapons. They had personnel reliability programs, they had background checks, etc. But it was, that program was being run by the ISI, their Inner Service Intelligence Organization, which was the same group that was responsible for running the jihadi terrorist mm -hmm. organizations and supporting them so that they would go and fight inside Kashmir or elsewhere. So you had the same group of individuals who had some sympathy or at least some ties with what I would call terrorist organizations, the jihadis going to attack inside Mumbai or Delhi or elsewhere. And they were the guys responsible for vetting the security for nuclear weapons. I think that was really foolhardy. Now, fortunately, Khalid Kidvai, the head of the Strategic Plans Division, and the Pakistani military began over time to recognize that this was not the best recipe mm -hmm. and, as far as I know, has, has changed that policy. And at least according to the United According to the New York Times, uh, the United States government has spent, uh, according to the Times, over $100 million in assistance to the Pakistani military to help reduce the likelihood that their weapons could be stolen. So, so one way to deal with this situation is, in fact, uh, to develop mechanisms for a learning process by people who, by states that have acquired uh, the nuclear weapons. Uh, and about whose uh, uh, arsenal there's little we can do once they have it. Right. We can help them make their arsenal safer to learn the things that the United States uh, has learned uh, about how to prevent the kind of accidents and bureaucratic pathologies that you've talked a about. Absolutely. I've often quoted Bismarck, uh, the great German chancellor who once said that only a fool learns from his mistakes. Wise people learn from other people's mistakes. <laughs> and therefore, we have, I think, an obligation. We certainly have an interest, and I would say an obligation, to be more forthright in encouraging other countries, if they acquire nuclear weapons, to recognize the grave consequences and how risky this is. We may not want them to get nuclear weapons, but if they do, we want to try to encourage such um, vicarious learning, learning from, from, from our mistakes. The rub here comes in that the um, traditional interpretation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which under Article 1 of the NPT, it says that nuclear weapon states must not help non-nuclear weapon states acquire nuclear weapons. And before 9-11, the interpretation, in the State Department at least, of that clause was that that would prohibit any kind of sharing of technology with any state, not just Pakistan, but any state that acquired nuclear weapons. Indeed, on 9-11, I was in Washington getting ready for a meeting uh, at the National Security Council staff where a number of us were being asked to try to share our views on the Pakistani nuclear force and how to interpret Article 1. After 9-11, Colin Powell and the State Department turned around very quickly <laughs> and said, this is extreme interest. and." Um, the full details of what the United States did there and how we did it and how far we went uh, are classified. But the reports in the Times suggest there's been sharing of some technology um, and some procedures, best practices, learning from mistakes, learning procedures. Uh, what the Times also reports, this is in the work of David Sanger, um, is that we don't know how well they've implemented it. The Pakistanis have an interest to accept information, procedures, technology, they also have a disincentive to let us see how they're implementing it because that would, again, redu reduce the, the invulnerability of their forces because they know that someday uh, we may try to take them out. You've thought a lot about uh, adapting the uh, non-proliferation treaty to the, the challenges that are, have emerged 
because of globalization, because uh, of 9-11 and so on. Let's talk a little about that. The bargain was that the, the nuclear powers would cut back on their arsenals uh, and that uh, the non-nuclear powers would not move in the direction of nuclear weapons, but would still have access to the technologies that would uh, make possible alternative energy sources. Peaceful nuclear, nuclear, civilian nuclear, use. Yeah. So, so talk a little about that. How, how, how do we have to adapt? What changes uh, do we have to make in the, the structures of supervision and monitoring on the one hand? Who has to pay for that? And then on the other hand, uh, how do we not uh, deny these non-nuclear states uh, the benefits of nuclear power technology? Um, I think the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, is both one of the very most important treaties that exist in the world today and one of the least well understood. The basic bargain that you outline that the nuclear weapon states would agree to disarm is not quite right in terms of the exchange for peaceful nuclear energy use and um, and the non-nuclear weapon states agreeing not to acquire nuclear weapons. The bargains are more subtle and more contested. The nuclear weapon states did not agree that they would disarm. They agreed that they would work in good faith towards disarmament because they recognized that they didn't want to get into a treaty that was time-bound, that said exactly what they wanted to do. We're in the middle of the Cold War when this was signed. So they agreed to work in good faith and then every five years try to demonstrate what they've done. There have been some times where, in my judgment, what we did was not in good faith. But I think the Obama administration recognizes that they have to take good faith efforts and make some progress. They don't have to say when we will disarm, how we're going to do it. It's going to be very complex. It may not occur, as the president put it, in his lifetime. But he wants to insist and push the United States in that direction. Under Article 4 of the treaty, the um, Nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states agreed that nothing in this treaty will stop the uh, inalienable right of all countries to acquire peaceful nuclear energy contingent upon the states being in compliance with Article 1 and Article 2. Well, a couple points about that. First off, it's unfortunate that we used 18th century natural law language in the inalienable rights out of the Declaration of Independence. Um, uh, Albert Wollstetter once quipped, it's a, if people have uh, uh, the right uh, to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of plutonium. Um, hmm. Instead, of, they wanted states that signed that, non-nuclear weapon states, wanted to say that this is an inherent right. They, they wanted to say it, but they added that contingency at the insistence of the nuclear weapon states that it's your right provided that you are complying with your promise under Article 2 not to seek to acquire nuclear weapons. So that's the big debate about Ar with Iran today, is are they in compliance? And in this particular case, the IAEA has repeatedly, as recently as uh, February uh, 2011, said that they have evidence that suggests that Iran is not in compliance with their promises not to seek nuclear weapons, and therefore they have gone to the Security Council, and the UN Security Council has said this is a threat to international peace and security and put on sanctions. The rub is not on the compliance and verification issue. The rub is on the enforcement, because the United States and other states have not been able to agree on anything other than, uh, than sanctions. Now, I'll add um, two last points about potential reform, because you asked, what mm -hmm. can you do to strengthen it? Um, it's going to be very hard, but very important. Uh, it's hard because the treaty is what, 189 states now are a member of it. Um, you can't really amend it, because to amend it, you'd have to open it up for ratification, and you'd have to go back to all those states, and you'd have new debates. This would be a, a real mess. So instead, I think the only things that you can do is either get agreements voluntarily within the organization or have other organizations impose constraints even if there's not unanimity behind them. So we do have these other organizations. Uh, importantly, we have the Nuclear Suppliers Group. 
Nuclear Suppliers Group is a cartel, if you will. It's the countries that are involved in exporting technology, not all nuclear power consumers, but the exporters. And they, in my judgment, would be, um, would improve world security if they agreed not to export nuclear technology to any country that has not agreed to have advanced safeguard inspections on their systems, what's called the additional protocol of the IAE, of the Atomic Energy Agency, where uh, they can inspect anywhere at a moment's notice. If countries don't agree to that, I think the nuclear suppliers group should agree not to sell them uh, technology. And lastly, there's a, um, a, a loophole, if you will, in the treaty. Uh, the treaty, like all international treaties, the NPT has a withdrawal clause that says if a country believes that it is in its supreme national interest to withdraw from the treaty. It can do so with 90 days notice after it tells the United Nations Security Council or the IAEA Board of Governors. That has been practiced only once by the North Koreans. The loophole is that there's nothing in the treaty one way or the other that says what happens to the nuclear materials that you've acquired while you're a member of the treaty. Hmm. So the default was what North Korea did. said, well, it's our stuff. We bought it, even though we got it because we were a member of the treaty at the time. Others, myself included, said, well, this is not a good situation and that we should create some kind of return to sender system whereby you still have a right to withdraw from the treaty, but that the nuclear suppliers group should not sell you certain technologies, sensitive technologies, unless you agree to return them to the point of origin if you ever withdraw from the treaty. Does that stop a country from cheating? No. Does it deter them? Potentially. Does it ensure that there'd be enforcement if they broke, not just withdrew from the treaty, but broke that part of the agreement? It doesn't guarantee that we'd enforce it. It increases the likelihood. So I think that would be an additional um, strength of, of a new regime, although it can't really be done through the treaty mechanism itself. Is there anything that we should be doing toward Iran that we're not doing to, to keep them from making that last step to the acquisition of nuclear weapons? Uh, or uh, is there something that we sh are doing that we shouldn't be doing? Uh, well, first off, I think the Obama administration has done the right thing by reducing the nuclear threats against Iran. Under the April 2010 Nuclear Posture Review, we said that we hold open options of using nuclear weapons against countries that are not in compliance. But when asked about what you would do under many circumstances, the president has repeatedly said that um, all options are on the table, but I wouldn't use nuclear weapons under these circumstances. Um, when asked in a similar situation, President Bush was asked, uh, there have been reports that uh, the Pentagon has been planning potential nuclear uses against Iran. Um, would those, are those reports true? And he said, all options are on the table. And when they said, well, we understand that, but are you saying nuclear options are on the table? And President Bush looked at the camera and said, all options are on the table. Now, that's the kind of threat that you make when you think that maybe deterrence is always a good thing. But if you think that threatening nuclear weapons use against a non-nuclear weapon state might increase their incentive to get nuclear weapons themselves, this is not a wise thing. So that, that's a positive step. Um, I think the biggest challenge will be um, creating an incentive structure in Iran so that they don't want to uh, at least acquire the bomb option. And that's going to be really hard given how far along they've gotten. Um, it is quite possible a, um, a deal could be struck if they really thought the regime was going to fall and the only way that they could keep it would be to give up that bomb program. Um, but the cost of doing that would be accepting the Iranian regime. After all, we did get a deal with Libya. Mm -hmm. The Libyans gave up, Colonel Gaddafi gave up his nuclear program after it was exposed. He had denied having one for years, was caught, gave it up, I don't think he gave it up because he thought we were about to attack them. He gave it up because his government was under such severe pressure that it was going to fall. 
So there's a, a, a real hmm. dilemma that we have. Sometimes we have to choose between non-proliferation and regime change. Uh, in most cases, I'm enough of a realist of an older camp to think that we might want to accept non-proliferation as being more important than changing regimes. But I think it's very rare that we don't face that kind of choice. Uh, Scott, I want to thank you uh, for being on our program. I want to show two of your books in case any people in our audience uh, want to pursue some of these topics. Inside Nuclear Asia, a book uh, which you edited, which uh, really gets at a lot of the problems both in India uh, and Pakistan. And then uh, your, the second edition of your ongoing debate, uh, The Spread of Nuclear Weapons, your ongoing debate, uh, with uh, Ken Waltz. I think both are, uh, uh, are nice compliments to what we've discussed here. So, so thanks for being with us today and sharing your reflections on proliferation. Thank you, Harry. It was a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.